everybody doing this evening? Oh, come on. I know we could be a little louder. How's everybody doing this evening? All righty. Let's stand up and let's just get ready to praise God tonight. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. All right. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, Father, thank you for this beautiful Wednesday that you blessed us to see, Father. Thank you for allowing us to make it here safely, for us to be with our family and our friends, Father. God, that we just worship you tonight, and that we just focus on your love and your beautiful presence, Father. God, that with everything that's weighing us down, anything that's stressing us out, Father, that we just put it into your hands, Father, because you're in the center, Father. We thank you for every blessing and every opportunity in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I try to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight No matter what, I face you by my side When you don't move the mountains I need you to move When you don't pop the waters I wish I could walk When you don't get the answers And I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you you have not seen so when all things be my life and bread i want what you lord and nothing less when you don't move the mountains i need you to move when you don't pop the waters i wish i could walk through. when you don't give the answer and i cry out to you
precious love and beauty in this world. For nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong Holder of my future days to come Your presence is Sing it out. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I dream from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are
gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down our hearts. Come on, let's just shout to him, you are good, one more time. So we are uh, in the book of Numbers, and um, let me picking up in Numbers chapter 22, it's towards the end. Uh, last time we were here a couple of weeks ago, uh, a prophet, who's not necessarily a godly man or godly prophet, but he was a prophet nonetheless, and he had certain supernatural abilities that are real. He had abilities that um, he could seek in seances, spirituality, and somehow he had a reputation that uh, he had this supernatural connection because the king of um, Moab, Balak, had uh, sent messengers over 300 miles just to get a message to him to come and curse the Israelites. And uh, so his reputation must have been pretty, pretty strong. He must have had some good success in his ability to connect to the supernatural world, because there is a supernatural world, you do know that, right? It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities is another name for demons, right? So uh, we understand that we are in a spiritual warfare, that those things are real, seances, uh, going to psychics and those kind of things, man, you never know what you might tap into uh, by going to those people or looking for those kind of answers for your future. Let me tell you something. God has already determined your future. And if you'll just trust him, he'll just walk you. Just trust him to walk you out, walk you into himself. You just got to trust him. Don't, don't lean on these other supernatural things that are outside the will of God because um, God has a good plan for you. Let me read something to you before we get into uh, 
this second part. We've already kind of went over um, um, Balaam getting rebuked by a donkey. Um, but the Lord's going to let him go on and, and travel all the way into Moab. But in, uh, you know, in the book of Deuteronomy is it basically a, just a second history that we've read in you know, Exodus and Leviticus. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I didn't put this up here. Uh, listen to this. I just want you to listen. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. Listen to what it says. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you. Because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of Pharaoh, of a house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God. So he's just telling them that there wasn't anything particular about them as a people that he chose them exactly like us. Exactly like us. So in uh, Numbers chapter 22, uh, we're going to pick up in verse, we'll pick up in verse 34. Uh, I'm not going to go back and retract some of this stuff right now, but, uh, well, hold on, let me show you something. I know you may not be able to see this right here very good, but um, these are former apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, we know that of all the apostles, only John, uh, who was the writer of John, and the writer of Revelations, we know that he's the only one that was not murdered, but everybody else that followed the Lord was murdered, matter of fact, uh, the Apostle Paul was beheaded. That's a very, it's probably a better way to die because it's pretty quick. But it's pretty gruesome at the same time. And you know who else was beheaded? The, who, who Jesus said was the greatest man that ever lived? John the Baptist. John the Baptist was arrested for something stupid. Arrested for something that... He didn't really do, I mean, he did call out the king for his sin. He did do that. He told the truth. And because of that, he was put in prison. And because of a, uh, a lustful, wicked wife, he ends up being beheaded. Two great men that served the Lord Jesus Christ. Two wonderful men. Many men. Many men who loved the Lord, who loved God, and the end result of this life was a murder, was that where they were murdered. So I tell you that because I want you to think about what you expect from the Lord. This is what you expect from the Lord. How do you expect the Lord to um, reward you in this life? Do you expect to be rewarded? Because in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to be getting there. It says some were beaten, some were this, some were that, some were murdered, so that they would have a better resurrection, which is better treasure in heaven. They allowed themselves to be taken out of this life in a cruel fashion to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you that Satan wants to put that fear inside of all of us. When we read, when we read what's going to happen right here, I'm going to tell you one thing. The devil cannot do what God will not allow. The devil cannot do what God will not allow. But here's the deal. You can allow some things. You can allow the devil to do some things. You can allow the devil to come in. You can allow the devil to come in and destroy your life. You can do it. Balaam did it. Balaam was so close to the Lord. I mean, he could hear his voice. He could let the Lord speak to him. He could declare a blessing over the children of Israel. But yet he was a wicked, wicked man. Real quick. In 2 Peter, it says, These, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. 
and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. These are people on the inside he's talking to. On the inside, sometimes they get into Christianity. They, not necessarily in our church, could be, but they creep into Christianity. They creep into the, to the, to the church of Jesus Christ. It says, they have a heart trained in covetous practices. That means they see what you got and they want it. They see what the world has and they want it. That's what covetousness means. And are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Listen, they have forsaken the right way, which means they were on the right path. They were that close. And have forsaken it for selfish gain, for the things that this life can bring them by preaching the gospel. The benefits of preaching the gospel. The benefits of preaching the gospel should always be a struggle. Because the devil is not happy with what we do. Now, God will get us through these struggles. God will walk us through these struggles as we submit to his word, as we submit to his will. He'll do it. He'll walk with us right through this whole thing. And we'll see that with the Israelites. And it says, following the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And that's what we're going to see tonight. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with the man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackest of darkness forever. These are men that are close. I think that sometimes the Lord just wants us to kind of, you know, he doesn't want us to fear our salvation. He doesn't want us to fear that we're going to go to hell or anything like that. But he wants us to fear the way we live and to, and to act right and choose to do the right thing and, and, and live in a correct manner. That's what he wants from us. Listen, let's go back to um, um, verse 35. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So now he's on his way. God has already told him that he couldn't curse them and not to go with them. Now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border at Anron, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send to you calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you now. I have, have I any power at all to say anything? Uh, the word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak and they came to Kurzot. Huzab. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. So it was the next day that Balaam took Balak, that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to a high place of Baal, uh, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. So he takes them up to a high mountain uh, and lets them see the Israelites spread out. Two to five million people, three million people just spread out, just, just as far as the eyes could see. And he, wanted, he wants them to curse him. And so they get the sacrifices ready. Of course, sacrifices to their demon gods. But it says, Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam ordered, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height and God met Balaam and he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Then the, then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and thus you shall, you shall speak. So he returned to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up this oracle or prophecy and he said, now let's listen to what he says. Because it's very interesting what he says here. If you just pay attention to, to, to some little hints, there's some interesting things. He says, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram. From the mountains of the east, come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? 
And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him. Listen, now he's going to refer to Israel as an individual, him. So as we see the word him, he's referring to Israel, Jacob, the nation itself. All the men and women and children are, are referred to, 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 to him in here. It says, from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him, there a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Here he is saying that I have chosen this group of people to be different than the rest of the world. They're not like the rest of the world. The Canaanites are like the Amorites. The Amorites are like the Jebusites. The Jebusites are like the Hittites. The Hittites are like the otherites. And they're all kind of like each other. They all worship Baal. They all worship the same kind of gods, little different fashions. But they're all alike, except Israel. Even today, Israel is almost by itself, alone in the whole world. Of all the world's nations, the the the. The United Nations didn't even want to recognize Israel. And the United Nations is like the world government that, that pretty much says how the world's supposed to be. And they won't even want to recognize. You know who the only ones that recognize them is us, pretty much. But it seems like there's coming a time where we won't even do that. Because it says they stand alone by themselves, this nation. Let me tell you something, church. We're going to be alone one day, too. We're not like the world. We ain't supposed to be like the world. We live in the world. We do business with the world. Sometimes we got to dress a little bit like the world because it's just how we dress. But we don't have to act and live like the world. We can be different in the midst of the world so that the world recognizes us as being different. There should be people in your life to go, there's something different about you. You're a little different. And for a lot of you, you probably get that every now and there's something about you for other reasons, probably. You'll catch it later. But then in verse 10, it even mentions a promise that God blessed Israel or, J or Abraham when he said, I'm going to make you as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number one-fourth of Israel. This is him looking forward and just seeing the vast number of Jewish people and Israelites, Hebrews, uh, come into existence. And then he says something interesting. He says, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Somehow God gave Balaam this supernatural ability to see forward in time, to see the future of Israel. We'll see he, there's going to be like seven different prophecies, seven different speeches or blessings over Israel. And in one of them, he is going to point to the Messiah through Israel. I think the next one, he says there's a king coming. Or they have a good king. And right now they don't have a king per se because God is their king. But Balaam says, let me die the death of the righteous. Well, let me tell you something. That's interesting that he says that because we know that the Israelites are not righteous. We've just watched them rebel and rebel and rebel. We just watched them get bit by snakes and serpents and, and thousands of them die for sinning against Moses, for complaining against the manna. We just saw that. So where's the righteousness that he's seeing? Where's the righteous? He's foreseeing a different kind of righteous. We know, I think this is interesting. In Romans chapter 3, this is what it says. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And then he goes on to say, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He's just generalizing all human beings. We're not righteous. When he prophesies this, he is seeing Christ through 
that he's seen the Israelites through the, through the life and resurrection or death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how he's seeing us. Because even us, let me ask you this. You ever been mad at somebody at church? Have you ever maybe thrown a curse at them? Not necessarily a curse word, but, oh, you suck. That's a curse. That's a curse. That person's terrible. You speak that over somebody. That person's mean. You speak that over. So in a way, we do that to each other. We don't even realize what we're doing sometimes, and that's what we do. That's just what we do. Look, it's in us to curse. It's in us. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of understanding. It takes a good relationship with Christ to be able to zip it, to be able to calm your heart, to not let your heart speak those words, to let your heart reveal to you why that would be wrong, why you should take the wrong. Because in Corinthians, he says you're all suing each other. You're all going to court against each other in front of Gentiles, and y'all look like y'all don't even know what y'all doing. Don't you know you're going to judge angels? Don't you know? Wouldn't you rather be wronged? Wouldn't you rather take the short end of the stick? Who in here would say, that sounds like a good deal? Nobody wants the short end of the stick, especially from a fellow church member. Especially from a fellow church member. But we do. It happens. What do you do? You, you go to the Lord and you let the Lord teach you how to take it like a Christian. Not a man. Like a Christian. Like a Jesus living inside of you, Christian, who took it on himself. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Hallelujah. You do not want to stand before the Lord without the shed blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins. You do not want to stand there. Check this verse out. For the time has come. This is New Testament. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. You're Christian. You're Christian. Well, God's going to test you. God's going to judge you in the kind of Christian you are. What kind of Christian are you? You're compromising Christian? You're going to get judged there. Are you a Christian that backslides a lot? You're going to get judged there. Not, not eternal judgment. He's going to judge you here. He's going to put you through fire he's going to let certain things happen if you're not walking correctly he's going to let it happen because the Israelites if they just do what they're supposed to do and just live the way they're supposed to live judgment wouldn't be coming on top of them Balaam is he speaking what God is telling him to speak in his heart in his heart he's thinking I want to get my hands on that money that that man, that, that king has promised me. I want to get my hands on that treasure, on that wealth he's promised me. And every time he opens his mouth, he speaks the truth that God tells him to speak. It's not what the king wants to hear. And so when it's all said and done, it tells us later in a different verse in, um, in Revelations. It says, talking to the the, 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 the church of Pergamos because you have there in your church those who hold the doctrine of Balaam doctrine of Balaam what would, what's the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality he even though he spoke the truth that what God said in his heart he wanted that treasure and he says I can get that treasure I just got to tell the king to send his young women down there in the camp and let him shake that thing let him put the music on and do what they do and seduce your young men and, and, and seduce them into the, into the, 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 um, the worship of Balaam, Balaam uh, uh, Baal, the worship of Baal. Listen, this world, every time you turn on music and television and different things like that, you will hear 
the whisper of Satan trying to draw us away. Every time. You're, we're not always that strong. It's, it, it's, it's seducing. It pulls us, we pull ourselves back. It'll pull us, we pull ourselves back. That's why many of us have to walk around saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Help me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Help me, help me, you know, help my mind. When my mind starts to drift, Lord, just help me, help me, help me, Lord, and just put me on track, Lord. And so we're constantly in relationship with the Lord trying to get our help because we understand that there's nothing good inside of us. There's this flesh inside of us is something else. But look, it says... For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Then he says this. Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved. Scarcely saved, Lord. What do you mean scarcely saved? Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, here's the definition. With difficulty. Not easily. Scarcely. Very rarely. Hardly have much work. I think that's, that's probably the one that fits most of us. We have much work to do in our walk, to learn to walk in righteousness, to learn to walk in a way that honors the Lord. Look, you are saved if you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart. If you believe and you understand that you are a sinner, if you understand that there are things inside of you that you know aren't good. Look, who had to tell you murder was wrong? You just know it's wrong. God wrote, wrote those laws on our hearts. He writes those laws on our hearts. Unless you were born in a cannibalistic family and all they did was teach you murder, then you might just think murder's okay. But if you're like most of us, we know it's wrong. You know what's wrong. There's, there's things you knew was wrong before you became a Christian. Just knew it. Because God has wrote his laws on our hearts. We have to choose to rebel against what's on our hearts. When you, when you sin, when you stumble, when you fall, you know you do it. You know you're doing it. You know it. Because he loves us, he will judge us in that sin. Because, because he loves us. It's a different kind of judgment than eternal damnation. But it's a judgment that God has to purify us and purify you and do what he needs to do to get your attention because he needs you to represent, me, re represent him in a way that draws other people. Listen, when you die, when you go to heaven, this world that you think is so much is going to be the illusion. This world right here, this life that you're living, what you're going through, what you're experiencing, your injuries, your sicknesses, your struggles are all going to be a part of a dream. It will only be a dream that you vaguely remember maybe. This is not the reality. This will be a distant something. But what we're believing for, why we gather together, why we love on each other, why we forgive each other, why we learn to walk in love, why we try so hard to do the right thing, why we fight against ourselves so hard, it's because we know that there's a God. We know it. You know there's a God. I don't have to convince you. I just got to get you on board with believing for yourself. Show you what the word says so that you go, that's right. I need to quit playing around. I need to quit messing around. I need to get on board. Not easily. He says it. If the righteous are barely saved. He's saying about us because this is difficult. It is hard. It takes a lot of patience with yourself sometimes. It does. It's not easy. I, I tell the Lord all the time. I said, Lord. You just, you just made it so easy to sin. Oh, you didn't make it, Lord. I'm taking it back. You didn't make it like that. But, Lord, why did you let me be born in this day and age? Why couldn't I just be born when my, my parents were potato farmers? And we just potato farmed all day, and I couldn't get in trouble with, except with potatoes. <laughs> I don't know, Dad. I like French fries. <laughs> I like potatoes. I like potato chips. <laughs> If life was simple 
And it was just about feeding the chickens, feeding the cows, hoping to find a wife and get your own farm and take care of business. If life was that simple, it would probably be harder to sin. It would probably be, it'd, it'd be more good. To, we'd want to get together in church and see each other. But no, we've got hours and hours and hours of free time on our hand, hours and hours of opportunity to fill our minds, our, our, our thinking with things that, that, that tickle the flesh, that tickle the things about our, our flesh. I mean, I was full a while ago, and you brought me a piece of chocolate cake, and I ate it, and I ate it. I didn't have to eat it. I shouldn't have ate it, but I did. I ate it. I couldn't help it. I just ate it. Because, thank God, that's not a sin, maybe. <laughs> it, it might be later. But that's how, that's how easy our flesh is. That's just how easy it is. And we need to remember that. And we need, to, we need to, to live knowing how easy it is to stumble. And so we, 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 we have to be on guard. When it says fight the good fight, that means you got to go, there's probably going to be somebody coming right here to bring some lust at me. So I'm going to be ready for lust to come at me. There's probably going to be, you know, a person over here that's going to offer me something that I know is not good for me. So I need to be ready for when that comes. I say no to it and start preparing your mind for the battle ahead. Not just wait till you're in the battle because you don't always know what weapons to have sometimes we need to know our own weaknesses we need to learn our own weaknesses we need to understand our weaknesses we need to know when we fall into weaknesses where we were at what we were thinking how we were acting and watch ourselves this is a warfare he puts some of the responsibility on us that's a good thing so we're not robots. We're willing vessels with the choice to choose to follow him. And, and because I get to choose to follow him, it makes that relationship even more wonderful. You don't force somebody to love you. You earn their love. Jesus Christ came down. He... he, he he left us the Old Testament to point the way to himself. And then he showed up. And then he lived the life. And then he left his spirit behind. And then he gave us great apostles to, give, to, to show us that, that in this life following Christ, you don't always get a reward of a nice house and nice retirement. You get the end of an executioner's blade. That's what sometimes following Christ you get. Look, enjoy the ride because it's not going to last forever. And one day it will be a distant thing to us. Thank you, Lord. That's right. Then he said to me, the last chapter of the book, see that you do not do that for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. This is when John sees the angel or sees the, you know, sees the angel and he falls down and he says, don't fall down before me. And of, your, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Now, worship God doesn't mean what we do during the worship. Worship God means that you actively live your Christianity out in, in the world. You make decisions based on your relationship and your understanding of his word and the way you treat people and the way you forgive people and the way you love people and the way you serve and the way you just act in public and all the words that come out of your mouth. That's how you worship the Lord. That's how you truly worship him. And he said to me, do not seal the, prophecy, the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. He who is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And holy just means set apart. Just set apart for a certain purpose. What do you set apart for? What do you set apart for? I'm set apart to be Patricia's husband. I'm set apart to be Hannah's dad. I'm set apart to be Jacob's dad. I'm set apart to be your friend, your brother, your pastor. I'm set apart in a lot of different ways. But I'm truly set apart to mimic the Lord or to follow the Lord or to, or to reflect the Lord in my life. 
just like you are. That's, what you, that's, that's your purpose. That's why you're set apart. Look, you can go out there and you can live in the world and you can get tangled up in its stuff and get messed up in its mess. Or you can come around and fight through all that. You can fight through. You can give up or you can fight. Don't quit. I promise you, there's a reward at the end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, you love us. Father, we're, we're in so need of you. We need your grace. We need your mercy, Lord. We need your forgiveness. And Lord, we thank you that we have all those things. Lord, we need wisdom. Wisdom on how to walk this life out, Lord, how to treat others. Lord, wisdom to recognize the enemy as he comes. He can't put a curse on us, Lord, but he sure can tempt us. He can't speak negative things over us and bring it to pass, Lord God, but he can put negative things in our path and cause us to trip right over them. Lord, may, we, may our eyes always be on you. May our hearts always long for your heart. May our spirits always long to walk in the spirit. And Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.